Camera set and action. It's a road movie, it's a thriller, and it's a comedy sort of rolled into one. I thought it was really funny and really unusual. I hadn't read anything like it. It's a sort of low budget action movie, isn't it? So every day you find yourself doing something that you want to phone home about, do you know what I mean? Tell me mates about like, just waving a pistol around in public, like, like it's a dumb thing. Very dark. Um very kind of pertinent, if you like, to the times. Yeah, this film was very challenging, far from glamorous. Um, shooting in Newcastle in November, December, worst time of the year for, for light conditions, for weather. Yep. Yeah, it was very, very tough. He went through, what do you think of the background? And I said a few things, and I said, what do you think of the background? And he went, I think this, this, and this. And I said, fine, I'll play it like that. It's a thriller. It's a road movie. It's a coming of age. I loved all the actors. And the dialogue is brilliant. What's funny? When you get some of those lines, they're precious. Given sort of the epicness of the locations, it's been worth it in that respect because, I mean, the footage looks excellent. The motion of the, the pumps go in with the shards of light across the faces. Whoa, nice. It just looks phenomenal. Uh, the way they've, I mean, you, you walk into the building and you've got your own dynamic of the place, your own perspective. You perceive your own dynamic, you make your own mind. But when you start shooting it through a lens and that's the only perspective you see it on, it's the only format that you get, the place looks totally different. You know, the way they've lit it and whatnot is stunning. The other day I got material for the OK Diner and it was absolutely brilliant. It was beautiful and uh, you know, you had dolly shots into the actors, the lighting was great and I emailed them to say, hey, you know, fabulous. We go as far north as Holy Island and then as far south as Middlesbrough and as far west as Kielder. So it's like we really do cover like every area of the northeast. We go into these films with our eyes open. Everything is going to be a challenge. Every day is going to be a fight, a bit of good fight. The aspirations of this team is to make a very big movie, a very exciting and ambitious film, um, which is an intelligent thriller, uh, which is a funny thriller, which has some wonderful performances. And so Craig represents that kind of, you know, uh, vision. The project started with, um, I met Richard and Rupert following um, their film, uh, Truth or Dare, that uh, they'd been made with cinematographer James Friend, who's involved obviously in the liability too. And myself and James are business partners and have been friends for a very long time. And uh, James wanted me to meet Richard and Rupert on a day of a screening of Ghosted, my first feature film. And after seeing the film, they wanted to talk to me about the liability and sent me a script. And it kind of went from there, really. Yes. Um, this is an idea that I'd had in the back of my mind for a long time. And the catalyst was meeting um, Richard Johns. While we were both dropping off our youngest sons at nursery, uh, he pitched me the idea about a hitman standing right outside the nursery, which I thought was quite a fun place to be pitched about a hitman. As it was an idea I'd kind of thought about, I kind of had in the back of my mind. I wrote it very quickly, delivered it in April 2011, and they were shooting, Richard was true to his word, they were shooting it in November, so like 
hardly six months later. And within a year of the delivery of the first draft, the whole film was edited and locked and on its way to Cannes. So it was the most speedy <laughs> experience of my career, definitely. John Rathall, the writer, did such an amazing job in creating this story. Immediately, we both loved it. Um, I think probably the most telling thing is we were laughing in exactly the same places, although sometimes Richard would be laughing a little bit before I would, because he's a faster reader. Behind. Behind. <laughs> it reminded me a little of a film that I'd done very, very early on in my career called The Hit. Uh, it reminded me a little bit of that, um, where I played, a, I played a, what Jack O'Connell's playing now, sort of the driver in a way. So it's kind of fun. The crucial chemistry, of course, at the heart of this is between Roy, our hitman, and Adam, our wannabe. I remember immediately reading the film and being drawn by these two characters, Adam and Roy, and, and, and their journey, and the dynamic between them. And again, that was something that I really wanted to kind of draw out of, of what was already there, but maybe just play on it a bit more. Tim Roth. Um, we were so excited. Uh, when we'd heard from his representatives that he'd read the screenplay, that he really liked the screenplay, and moreover, that he already knew about the director's previous film. Well, Tim's such a great actor anyway, and you know he'll read what he reads from the page and he'll make his own assumptions from the character and what he believes it should be, etc. And then obviously, we all talk about what the character is. Roy, Roy's, um, yeah, kill, he kills people for a living, and he, um, but I think he's, he, the idea is that he's come to the end of that. He's, he's just about to enter into retirement, <laughs> and it's just, he, has to, he has to do a couple of jobs before he's, uh, before he can do that. Um, but the job that he is setting out to do is a particularly difficult one. I mean, I don't, I don't want to give the game away, but um, it, it's particularly difficult and. The relationship between Adam and Roy develops, you know, arcs over a period of only 24 hours, but develops from something that was very, could have been uh, very cold and distant into something quite warm. I mean, uh, warm for Roy is not particularly warm, but there's definitely an arc, you know. Roy, I think, again, the audience will feel for Roy, you know, despite his career choice. Um, he, again, it's, it's that same thing with people, killers that, you know, everybody loves somebody, no matter how evil they are, everybody loves someone and is loved by someone, and obviously Roy's character is besotted with his daughter who's getting married, so I think that, you know, you, 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 see, you see him going and looking longingly at her, so again, it's very human, it's, you, know, you can relate to it, even though he's a hitman. And he's funny, he's charismatic, he's attractive. That was the best one, yeah, that was great. <laughs> yeah, let's try and try it. on set anyway, and we're having a day of it and that, and he's enjoying it, can tell we're bad snuff each other and that. It's very humbling, it means that I'm sort of a bit more convinced about myself on a set, you know. I worked with him to a point where we was on a level. It wasn't so much me being in awe of the guy the whole time, because I could quite easily sit there and enjoy everything, you know, every detail that he gives in the scene and whatnot and his approach. There's a lot about it that does interest me, but I don't think we'll get anything done that way, so. When, when a really good actor like that, you just can't see, when they're doing it on set, what the camera is going to get, because I worked with Viggo Mortensen as well, and he was similar. If you watched him across the room doing it, you would think, He's just walking through it, he's not doing anything at all. And then you see it 30 foot high and think, ah, now I can see what's going on. And I think Tim has that same quality, that it's, he's dialed it so far down, but it means that every little nuance, some of the looks that he gives Jack, where you just don't need a line of dialogue because you just can tell exactly what he's thinking. I like, I mean, there's a very, there's a stillness and a coldness to him, which is, which is kind of interesting, which he gradually sort of falls away. And, I, and I, I find that kind of fun to play with. Um, and also, Roy's the straight man to, uh, to Jack's character. You know, he's, I have to play the straight man a lot. And that's kind of fun to play. Where just being completely speechless by what the, the other guy has just said, you know, and just trying to get that. I mean, when we started working on the script together, myself and Craig, I constantly was just trying to cut my dialogue back and back and back and back and back to virtually have him being, you know, 
a silent movie character at times and, and just reacting to what he was being given by Adam. So Tim brought a great sort of subtlety, I think, to the table with his character and how he wanted to define it. Um, and Craig was thrilled about that because really it became a collaboration between them. And um, obviously that's a dream for us to know that our director and our, our lead actor are sort of working quite so closely together. The books were really detailing how soldiers become void of emotion and were kind of lost when they came home and looking to, to find the battlefield again to feel alive. And I think that was something that was quite important for us, which is why Tim's character is so still, because this kind of mundane, normal existence is, uh, is nothing to him now. Roy is winding down, you know, he's kind of disillusioned with life. He's, you know, he's, he's done what he's had to do in his life, but he's, he's retiring, whereas Adam is young and fresh and excitable and full of gusto and a love for life and I think Miguel finds that attractive. I mean, when I, when I, I saw him, his screen test, um, he obviously, he clearly thought about it, but, he, he, but he's a very natural actor. He's very, you know, it's not, I mean, I know he does a lot of work and does a lot of homework and so on, but he's a very, you know, he's, he goes a lot on gut, gut instinct and, um, and, uh, and we'll, and, but it's hard, it's hard to explain what he does because it's, it's, he seems so very, very natural when I first saw him. He's perfect for the character. I mean, he's perfect. The way he's playing is absolutely perfect. It's exactly what I kind of had imagined before I'd even met him. Jack's a very endearing and, and a warm character and he's naturally likeable and that's what, something I had to find in in the actor that was going to play um, Adam, so. You know, he's sort of this hapless kid that wants to be a, a, you know, a big cheese and he keeps making terrible mistakes, um, but he's very lovable. I think the audience will really feel for him, you know, and be rooting for him. And um, all I can say, Adam to me is my son, who I actually, you know, I do love and I do care about. And maybe initially you might think, you know, even though it's a small part, but if you really want to read into it initially, you might think in the beginning, well, she doesn't give two hoots really about him. Maybe not, she doesn't care that much because Peter treats him like a, more well, like a piece of shit. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah, let's, let's talk about Adam. I didn't want to make him no eccentric or nothing above the ordinary. I didn't want him to be antisocial at all. I wanted him to just be, you know what I mean? comfortable with himself. Even though he's had a shit time, I didn't want him to come across like he mopes around feeling sorry for himself. I think Adam is very straightforward and very, uh, you know, enthusiastic about life, but he's in a very difficult place. I mean, his relationship with his mother and his relationship with his stepfather uh, is a, is a, a not a particularly um, healthy one, you know? I didn't, I didn't perceive Adam as someone who who would completely lose the plot though, for right it all. Otherwise it'd be written on the page. You know, I didn't want it, it to be completely out of his league. There are times where, you know, he, he probably couldn't control what was going on or, be, you know, probably couldn't, he'd never picture himself in the setting that he's in. But what I liked about the character anyway, what I find endearing is that he just takes it in, man, and he does listen, and he's got a bit about him, he's clever. He's not a dunce or, you know, he's not selfish enough to feel sorry for himself and mope about the place. Instead, he just cracks on with it and throws himself in, into situations. So when he is out and about with a frigging hitman, of all people, even when he does pick up on that, I just, I've always pictured him as someone that wouldn't put this situations or these situations that he was in past him. Someone that would be capable of taking it in. Uh, when I was reading him on paper anyway, I found respect in him, like, he's had a shit time. And then he finds himself in a, in a very, a very difficult and very disturbing situation, but he adapts. And I think, I think what, what's, what, what I like about his, his character is that he is very, um, he learns quick, he's much smarter than, than he's given credit for. And, um, and, potentially very dangerous. 
Um, dangerous, certainly dangerous to Roy. He is dangerous to Roy, but he uh, is, is, you know, when he leaves the film, he is could be potentially quite a dangerous character. I think he does he does um, grow during the film. But he's still a boy. He's definitely a boy. Originally in the script, he was somebody who kind of wanted to be a gangster and then dis was going to discover in the course of the film that it wasn't for him. And then we took him more in the direction of being somebody who was more like a kind of ordinary kid, um, maybe a slightly nerdy kid who kind of got caught up in this world. But then when Jack was cast, he actually brought a lot of the original character back in because obviously Jack is a very kind of in-your-face kind of person. And, um, and it's brilliant. In the scene in the pumping station when he's actually got his shirt off, he actually has Jack the Lad tattooed on his arm, which, I mean, if you put it in a script, people would say this is a ridiculous cliché, but, but there it is. I just wanted to make him relevant to average people, to regular folk. I think it's, I mean, I really think it's his film. I think it's, a, it's, um, uh, it's really about that, their relationship, but it's about that character and how he survives this crazy journey. Yeah, Jack's brilliant. Um, and he's really, the great thing about Jack is he's really in every moment, he's in every scene. And he's more than happy to play around. He's more than happy to, obviously, in the course of a scene, you may change things and improvise a bit here and there. And Jack's more than happy to go along with it. Um, you know, I think it's just, uh, for me, Jack's a very natural and very gifted actor, you know. He's, he's very funny to work with. It makes me laugh. It came through as an audition from my agent, like most things do. And I was out in LA, so I put myself on tape and sent the tape off, and then got a call a couple of days later to say that um, I got the job. So it was, it was good, it was fast, it was exciting. The script was really interesting and unusual and um, really funny. And actually, because I never spoke to Craig, the director, before I got the job, and so when he first rang me, I said, oh, wow, I thought the script was hysterical. You know, I was laughing out loud. And he turned his head and goes silent on the end of the phone. And then he went, it's about sex trafficking. I was like, yeah, I know, but it's, <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> so that's why I, th I thought the script was really, I hadn't read anything like it. What made Taluda's character work was the decision to make her Eastern European, um, which Richard and Rupert quite resisted. I'm not quite sure why. I think maybe because they thought it would limit their casting options. Um, but in a way, because she plays a character who is to some extent a fairy tale character, there's an element in which is she actually a real person or is she a kind of force of chaos? Um, making her Eastern European meant she could have that kind of unknowable quality, which I think is crucial to making her character work. I think we've all encountered um, it's a kind of cliche now, the kind of inscrutable Eastern European waitress or whatever one encounters who speaks in monosyllables or whatever. And so it was an attempt to kind of do something with that stereotype so that you can, because she gives so little away, you can kind of project onto her what you need to project onto her. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, how can I put this? and still maintain some integrity within the business. <laughs> uh, professionally, professionally she's great to perform off, like she's got a challenging role, uh, having to adopt an Eastern European accent. Uh, but I mean, she must have done a fair bit of work beforehand because she was just ready to go first day. I met Tallulah briefly at a read through and then um, and then we the next thing I knew we were working together in the woods you know doing sort of kind of scary uh, scene I thought she was very very good and I don't I don't know I know that she's coming from America to do this like somewhat like myself um, and then we just started working over the past, past couple of days we don't get that much um, stuff together so but she seems very very good and she's very game she's up for it because it's quite tough what she's doing, but she doesn't seem to be particularly phased uh, by what's going on. She, she goes about her business. There's a, yes, there's a wonderful little smile she does at, in one scene, um, which is great, which suggests that there's an element of enjoyment, that she's not purely driven by these circumstances 
that she finds herself in, but that there is a level of kind of cat and mouse enjoyment that she has as well. And she does that brilliantly just with one little smile at one stage. So yeah, she definitely brings a, she's definitely made that slightly fairy tale character come to life. The girl is very, she's um, an incredibly passionate, driven character. Um, you know, she's obviously motivated by the, the death or the disappearance of her sister. And um, she's out there to seek revenge on all the guys that put their hands on her sister. So Lula's character, the girl, obviously had to be, um, you know, seeking vengeance for her sister, etc. So we just kind of looked at um, some previous cases and I'd sent Salula some information about um, trafficking routes from the Baltic and, and what kind of girls were kidnapped and had case studies and we talked about that at length and also um, took Tallulah to, to a show called Roadkill in London which is kind of an interactive theatre piece um, that's about a young girl who's trafficked from Nigeria and her experiences in London. It's uh, pretty brutal and uh, I think that left a mark on Tallulah and I hope it had the, uh, the intended effect. Craig, the director, he, he took me to see a play called Roadkill about sex trafficking, which was just so horrific. I mean, the play was excellent, really well done, but the content was so horrific that I came out and I was like, right, I just want to castrate every male, you know, <laughs> within a 50 mile radius. Really got the, we call it the rage, because um, the girl has the rage. I think you can believe her in this role. And my worry was always that if you cast a kind of straightforward English starlet out of drama school, it might become slightly, slightly unbelievable. But I think she carries it off. Well, I think I love my husband's part, actually. The audience won't like his part because he's a bad guy but um, he's a control freak, and I can relate to control freaks because I've had control freaks previously in my life. So I can relate to his character. Peter Mullen's character came from, um, came from some, some real life, influenced by some real life criminals that again we, we discussed. I think the Peter character is pretty, in fact he's completely morally bankrupt, but he, Matt, he is, he's in control enough. I mean, if you were going to get psychiatric about it, you would have to say he's got some major personality disorder, probably NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. Um, but I, I think that kind of reduces it too much. I think he's more complex than that. But there's definitely is the ability to put a certain face on a public face when the private is ex is ugly in the extreme, is violent and controlling and deviant and devious and malevolent. Peter obviously is an amazing actor and to have that kind of that shift and the change that uh, Peter the character has in the film uh, needed an actor of that quality to, to be able to play that venom and that ominous presence and the kind of the, the, the still uh, evil, <laughs> if you like, uh, and then be able to kind of unleash it when, uh, when he needs to. And Peter's a, an actor that can certainly unleash his, uh, his anger, so, so yeah. He was a delight to work with as well because he, he mentioned that I met him in the lunch queue and he said, I won't even attempt to do his accent, he said very sweetly, did he mind if, I, if he did some improvisation? And I said no, because I'm a great admirer of the films he writes and directs as well. I said no, it would be an honour. And my God, what he meant by improvisation just went way beyond, I think, what even your most committed method actor would, <laughs> would understand by the term. We've never felt nailed down to the script, and I, think, I always think that's the best way. It's not in any shape or form disrespectful to the script, but in order to really bring it to life, it's not just about saying things in a convincing fashion. It's about, um, in those moments, uh, you know, living, breathing, and injecting it with as much of oneself as one can, within the limits of characterization, obviously. Yeah, I think that acting is like a game of tennis. Um, now, if you hit the ball, you, 
you're with a bad player, it doesn't come back. <laughs> you're with a good player, you bounce back. Do you know what I mean? And you, if you can play tennis, so it's bouncing. Visiting the set and seeing Peter Mullen do this absolutely extraordinary improvisation on a climactic scene in the story, which I think he did about seven or eight times, totally going totally stratospheric and then able to gather himself um, afterwards and, you know, have a sit down, have a fag, talk to people like a normal person and then switch this astonishing stuff on. I mean, it just was extraordinary. I mean, you read about actors who, method actors who have to stay in part and he totally didn't, didn't have that. And I said to him, you know, how can you, how long does it take you to come down? After he'd done one particularly kind of extraordinary um, homicidal rant and he said oh you know said i'm not one of those method actors it takes me about 30 seconds to switch off and then so it was incredible just to see that he could just do it and you know and it's there on the screen it's fantastic it's fun <laughs> bad guys are fun nikki's somebody who's um immaculate so quite opposite to me in real life you know i just she, she wouldn't go up the she wouldn't go up to the shops to buy a loaf of bread without being absolutely immaculate, like her full makeup would have to be on. A uh, uh, curl wouldn't be out of place. But on the other hand, that's that's probably because no, no, it's not. She is like that, but he makes her like that as well. He wouldn't be seen out with her otherwise. I think she's someone who, you know, fell in love. I think initially with a guy who has a certain amount of charisma, not a great deal, but um, and certainly not much that we see on screen. But I think in the past, I think things started off okay. She didn't have a lot of money, he did. And there would definitely, there's a, a, there's a shallow element to Nikki, the character. Everything has to be precise. Like you wouldn't sleep on Peter's side of the bed, my husband's side of the bed. I probably wouldn't even sit down on his side of the bed. Otherwise there'd be trouble. There's a crease in his side of it. Not that this is seen in the script. This is what we come up with. She's become a shrinking violet. So maybe initially she had this confidence because she had this career and lost the money and went out with this, this man who's got everything, you know, but he's, he's repressed, you know, suppressed her and she's this shrinking violet now that really can't probably say boo to a goose. Was definitely not to him. You know, and that's why I relate to that's why I relate to her, because I have seen those sort of men before. Yeah, Kirsten. Having seen the film, actually, Kirsten slightly ended up on the cutting room floor. I have to say, I never. When I wrote that part, I never imagined we would get an actress of Kirsten's quality to play it. And I was rather embarrassed thinking, oh my God, you know, could I not have given her something more to do? But um, actually in the finished cut, there's not very much of her left just because it was the bits you lose when you tighten up a film are the bits that you can afford to lose. And actually though there was something there, there were nuances there about her relationship with Peter and her it's kind of it's kind of gone, alas. Um, though I do, I have talked to Richard about um, writing a sequel in which she would actually be the main character. And what do you like about working with Craig? He's just walked in behind you. <laughs> That's going to make it difficult to answer the question. <laughs> oh, Craig's been brilliant. He's been, you know, he, he, he's, he's willing to take risks and willing to try things out. And, and he knows kind of where he wants to go with it. He knew how to talk to me. Not that there's any particular wrong way, but, you know, there's a respect thing as well. I trust what he's telling me, I trust his direction. And he is under a lot of pressure and he remains, as far as I can tell on set, he remains fairly calm. You know, I, I've seen his blood boil a couple of times, but so you need somebody that can do that, that can remain calm under pressure. I, I'm not necessarily the person that does. I, I can kick up a fuss. Craig is, is really going to be the key to this whole thing. You know, it's going to be really interesting to see what he does with it, and I'm excited to see the finished product. Um, and as a person, he's, he's really great. Um, he's a super nice guy, and um, 
very, very easy to work for and with. I think, he's, I think he approaches it all with the right mentality. And I know I'm supposed to say this because there's a camera in front of me and there's a likelihood that he'd watch it, but like, I'd be telling all my pals this when I get home. The highlight for me on this production was purely just, it's actually the crew and the cast and meeting the people that, that I was working with. And the crew in Newcastle were amazing. Obviously, I've never shot a film in Newcastle before. And I found everyone to be really welcoming and great fun. And I really, really enjoyed working with them and I hope that, you know, we work together in the future on many occasions. And also with the cast as well. I really, really enjoyed working with Peter, Tim, Jack, Kirsten, Tallulah, everybody. And I think we were blessed in the people that were involved in this production. And I think that would be my highlight. You don't always get to work with everyone that you like. And I'm glad that I got to work with everyone that I love, really. So. I think the, the, the great thing about independent cinema is it's not it's not the be all and end all. You know, you're actually trying to push the envelope a wee bit more and trying to find out how, how far, if you like, we could take our, our medium. Because it happened so quickly, is learning that. Um, Cut there. Right, go for another one straight away. It's okay, one more straight away. That the speed at which yeah. it's been done, I think, has hugely um, informed the spirit of the film. That often, as a script writer, you can write scripts. You go through drafts and drafts and drafts and drafts and you get it more and more perfect, but at the same time more and more dead. Um, and the great thing about doing this was hey, that go, 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 go. the hey, break, excitement go, go. about the original idea was still so much there carrying us through. Had we spent five years in development hell and written endless subplots and things, I don't think it would have improved the movie at all. It wouldn't, you know, because what you would have lost in those circumstances is just the energy and the forward movement. And so I think that's what I've learned is that I would love to work again in this way where you just go out and make it. Thank you.